This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible by the fine folks at MailChimp. MailChimp is an easy-to-use marketing platform with a name that might make it sound like they only do email. But they do just about everything to help businesses grow, like ads, postcards, landing pages, audience management tools, automations, reports, and more. You could say MailChimp grew so much that they outgrew their name, and their marketing tools can help you do the same. Go to MailChimp.com to sign up for free and see how MailChimp can help grow your business. MailChimp, they do more than mail. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 24th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome to uh, this week's fine episode. I realize now that I left my morning coffee outside of the podcast room as I look at Jeremy Williams drinking <laughs> his delicious, <laughs> fancy, cinnamon, star, anise-infused mm-hmm. cold brew. Orange peel. Orange peel yep. cold brew. Oh, it's going to make a rough <laughs> podcast. I'm so sorry. More energy, faster, and more intensity. I'm Norm and joined, of course, by Jeremy Williams here. Greetings. And Kishore's not yet back. We thought he'd be back this week, so we have another guest. It's Patrick Norton. Welcome back to the show, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Thanks if, for coming. If you're coffeeless and surly, does that mean I have to be sort of upbeat and enthusiastic? <laughs> Are we switching no. roles? I feel like I'm usually the cynical one on, a, on any given podcast Please everywhere. stick to your gun. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make this work. Thanks for coming in. I think we gave you a whole 20 hours notice. No, it was like 17. It was oh. good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a record low. Uh, but to be fair, Kishore gave us like 18 hours notice that he couldn't make it. He wasn't even going to be in the city. You and know, we what? said, a pod I, must be recorded. I, you know, I, I, I just looked at the boys. I'm like, do you want to go see something cool tomorrow? And they're like, yes. So they're out quietly doing math in the front room while we cast pod. Excellent. Do you have any fear? Of like what your kids may be doing in our studio right now. You know, now. the last time one of my children was was in the tested offices, he managed to shut off the video on the board while you and I were recording a podcast. If memory <laughs> I serves, heard, I, so, I remember that in the old office. Wow. Yeah. Seamus has standing orders to keep Tristan from touching anything. So if it starts sounding like a Tom and Jerry cartoon out there, I may have to check. <laughs> <laughs> The perils of fatherhood. I went to see a show last night and for the first time left with Nanak and left our child back at home with my mom uh, to watch him for, uh, I think, four and a half hours. It might even have been five hours. Mm -hmm. And guess what? What? I didn't feel a thing. I was just happy to be out in the world. I was not anxious. How was was Danica? Uh, Fine. We called in once during an intermission. Good for you. Impressive. Yeah, uh, but we were like, you know what? My mom raised three children. Mm-hmm. She's got this. <laughs> as long as she doesn't break a hip carrying the, the large baby up the stairs. You say that. That's it, fine. Is This is her first grandchild? First grandchild. Yeah. So Extra there's, precious. There's a rewarming period, I think, that grandparents have to go through. They have to warm back up to this idea. It's, and and this is the first time. Yeah, like, and, you were probably raised with cloth diapers. Yes. Yeah. And definitely without uh, diapers that had the... Uh, with that, with uh, the strip, the color changing strip. I think that's new to me. Wow. Do you know about this? No. <laughs> now diapers, standard, have a, li- a yellow line that goes from top to bottom. Are you serious? And it changes color when it gets wet. Wow. Is your child so, you so dehydrated you can't tell that it's relieved itself because the diaper isn't floating around its knees because there was so <laughs> little water? <laughs> now, with this, I, I just, it's, you know, there's yeah, well, a whole pregnancy test tie in there that I'm just not working with on any emotional level. Oh, we we use that because then we don't want to have to change the diaper if he hasn't gone. <clears throat> yeah. And when the color changes, then we know it's safe to remove the diaper. And but I guess you could go the old fashioned way and lift the child. And say, oh, he looks like he weighs a. Uh, the diaper's weighing two I was ounces say, more like, now. You know, as soon as like you pick the kid up, you pretty much know whether or not it's time to change the diaper. So maybe people want to do a longer distance. That's because you're old school, man. <laughs> these, these new parents, they have no idea. They need color-changing diapers. The trick is to not touch your child. All the, the Is that the 21st century? Yeah. Minimal contact. 
your minimal reading. Your my, grandkids. I got a robot that, that rocks the child. Your grand. No. Yeah, you, you literally do. I do. Your Actually, I, I, no. I, I, do you ever see this, the Sex in the City episode where the Hitachi vibrator ends up attached to the child? No, it's, no. It's, it's one of the great <laughs> parental hacks ever. Um, oh. And I was just it was in any case. Your oh. grandkids will have talking diapers. Nice. The diaper is wet. <laughs> <laughs> Change me. <laughs> Change me. You know, diapers Literally have the like Internet of shit. Diapers have, 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 have logo. Yeah, totally. Uh, have, have like <laughs> graphics on them. And I'm like, why do you need Elmo on the diaper when the toddler isn't forming memories yet? Like, Mo who memory. is this for? Like, if you're going to put branding or put characters, Dude, it's, do it for me. It's for you for the next 10 years. Well, the, the size zero and the size one diapers don't need no. the branding. It's, they're, sell, they're trying to yes. ingrain me with Elmo yes. and Sesame Street. That's not a value add for me. Yeah. You know, g- give but, me something but for useful. A lot of, it's, it's funny because... Dad jokes. Put dad jokes on the diapers. That is a really awesome idea. Right on the butt where they belong. Poop yeah. emojis. Poop emojis. They, there you go. Right? But I mean, like, I remember my wife is, was very intensely anti, like, cartoon character, character branding. Yeah. Um, to the point where, like, that's why we started stenciling T-shirts because everything was so, especially, like, like gender-coded for boys and girls when, when we'd be out shopping and stuff. But it was amazing some of the reactions I got. Um, from people who are like, you haven't taken your children to Disney yet? And I'm like, no. And if I'm lucky, I'll never have to go back to Disneyland again. And it's like, <laughs> more power to you if you enjoy it. But the last time I was there, I remember being like, wow, this is really expensive. And I spent half my day standing in lines with people shoving their giant pocketbooks full of God knows what into my back because they thought if they pushed me, the line would move faster. Wow. And that's all I remember from my last trip to Disneyland. That and a lot of weeping people, especially adults. <laughs> <laughs> Usually in line trying to buy a beer for what was it, like $42 or something. Cal- California Adventure, it's the only place in Disney they sell the beers. Yeah. Uh, I will not talk about too much about the show that I went to see, though, because I want to save that for next week's conversation. You don't even want to say what it was? It was a Cirque du Soleil show. So mm. I got, got to see the show that you would mentioned a few weeks back, Re- Volta. Highly recommended. And You highly recommended it, and I will now reaffirm that recommendation mm-hmm. because it blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the specifics, you'll have to wait until uh, the following weeks when Kishore's back. And maybe even a tested video <gasps> in the not-too-distant future. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of teasing there. Uh, but we've wanted to get you on the podcast for quite a while now. Back on the podcast, Patrick, because you, unlike us, actually went to CES. It hasn't changed a lot since last you were there. Only I, the products have shifted. <laughs> I've still felt the FOMO. <laughs> so lay it on us. We've read the news. What was your CES experience like? What were the best things that you saw and the things that you got to see? So a lot of incremental stuff. Like three of the big takeaways for me uh, was one watching. It was interesting watching as somebody spends a lot of time talking with Robert Heron about screens on AV Excel, watching, you know, LG be like, look, we have this amazing. We've done the, the roll up screen. We actually turned it into a product. We don't have a ship date. We don't have a price. Prepare to sell your car. But that was I don't really get giddy about products anymore ever. And watching that thing is one of the coolest things I've ever seen at CES because it was just like it would, you know, it's rolling up and the picture's going as it rolls up and it rolls back down. And it sounds so stupid to hear that out loud in my headphones, but it was really, really cool to see. What is the use case for that, though? Oh, so when you think about um, the vast majority of the population is living in very, very small spaces mm-hmm. and spaces that are getting smaller. And when you look at the longevity of screens, the number one thing, I, I had a conversation with Dell a few months ago and I talked to one of their engineers. And I was like, how do you make a, a, a screen last longer? They're like, don't put a screensaver on it and shut it off. Um, you can literally triple the length of the life of your monitor, right? When you look at the terms of, of monitor decay over like LEDs, like, you know, it's, it's you know, I think it's like if you leave it on 24 seven for three years, you've effectively reduced the brightness of the monitor by 50%. And by most standards, that's considered a, you know, time to replace the monitor. So, so simply by like not displaying anything on the monitor, mm-hmm. um, the monitor lasts a lot longer. But what? It, so what, why does that need to roll up? Well, a lot of, because basically a lot of people, especially if you live in a, if you have a very small living room, you walk into a room or a very small room where your, where your screen is, mm-hmm. it is dom like a 65 inch screen is a big black hole in most people's room. Even ah. if there's like, even if the Apple TV is playing its extraordinary images of whatever or whatever, you, or Roku's doing its goofy. It's to make your room more aesthetically appealing. I think so. Okay. I can't do my AR when the screen's in the way because the <laughs> spatial recognition right. won't, the, <laughs> it won't track the reflection off the screen. Gotcha. I mean, for people who are jumping in saying, 
this is crazy. People who are, have need for space aren't spending ten thousand dollars on TVs. You're not talking about this model. You're talking about what this technology could yes. pretend in the future when yeah. we it gets mass market adoption. The future of having the TV not be a fixture, a yeah. permanent fixture when you're not using it. Yeah, because right now, when you look at like what Samsung came out with as their kind of big drop was like, you know, we have a 98 inch 8K monitor. It is massive and huge and it will cover your wall and you can buy a house in 49 yeah. states for what this costs. Um, you know, and they, of course, when you look at that, you've got OLED, which currently has superior contrast because you turn an OLED pixel off and it's black. It's absolutely black. and. The, the Samsung. Um, There's a micro. You're talking about micro LCDs. I'm not even Ooh. getting into micro oh, LCDs. Oh, okay. Ooh, okay. Uh, but but in terms of you know, there's kind of a battle in terms of how do you define HDR and improve contrast. You know, with with the quantum dot technology, a lot of that is getting brighter light so that what is actually a very very dark gray and not black when the pixel is quote black looks like black because everything around it is so much brighter. But right. it was just funny to see like LG's like, look at this really crazy thing we we you know built out of a garage door opener and a box and a and a roll up. OLED screen versus Samsung going, we have an even bigger screen this year and it's 8K and there's no 8K content. Um, so that was, I mean, for me, that was interesting to watch. There's a whole bunch of, of actual 4K projectors finally coming out. Um, it was weird looking at, you know, gaming was huge this year. Um, NVIDIA basically didn't spend nine hours talking about everything but the new GPU. They kind of got straight into the 2060 really quickly, which is a fantastic card, although some people think like that should be a $200 card, not a $350 card, an argument I don't really want to play out anywhere other than the YouTube comments have already played it out in. Um, you know, it, it, Intel actually talked about the processors, you know, fast and early and basically saying more cores, more performance, and, you know, their next generation... Um, chip architecture, they're talking about taking, you know, potential battery life from 15 hours up to 25 hours. Um, We're talking about the, uh, not for desktop though, Which this, I mean, yeah. not, not, not even for high-end laptop. This is all in like the... All the laptops. The, well, I mean, you know, with the, you know, the, the, the more power sipping stuff. Yes, but, yes. Um, yeah, I think they have enough issues at this point with the performance laptops keeping the processors cool. Um, Dell, and I should point out the, the CES coverage we did at Tech thing was sponsored by Dell, but, but looking at... Uh, Dell's uh, one fixing the delete expletive nostril cam on the XPS series, which is long. Oh yeah, overdue. this yeah. is so the XP. The, 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 let people know the Dell XPS laptops, the 13 inch, and I guess the 15 inch as well has been very popular ultrabook alternatives to yeah. uh, to the MacBooks. Uh, they perform well, they look great, but the long-standing problem was that the f uh, user-facing camera mm -hmm. has been in the hinge. Yeah nostril looking yes. as opposed to because they want the slim bezels and so where do they put the camera now they put the camera directly center above the screen they have a slightly larger bezel and they reduce the camera size from seven millimeters to 2.5 millimeters oh it's not a reverse notch no 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 although no, we've seen some reverse notches seems like a no-brainer yeah and i'm finally i'm glad they finally did that but going back to the roll-up tv i <laughs> get what you're going what you mean but the thing that i think about is the mechanical problems yes do i need to add mechanical complexity to the appliance. You're saying I, if the roller motor stops yes. working, you can't even watch your TV. Yes. Like, why do we need that type of the gearing and, and, and not just the cost, but the maintenance required for for that? Well, what they're, what they're claiming, uh, the number original number I heard was 20,000 cycles on that, which I think even a hyperactive toddler, you know, on uh, all of the sugar. Uh, uh, yeah, but I mean, that's uh, like 20. What's your garage door? What's the cycles on your garage door? Probably a lot less than that. Okay. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. It's been so long since I've had a garage door. Um, I also heard some later reports that people were claiming that that, that it would be cycling up to 50,000. But 20,000 cycles is, if, if it's legit and their engineering is good, that's a pretty long time. That's a lot of cycles. Okay. All right. Um, and for the price point this thing might end up shipping at, yeah. I don't think the maintenance costs are going to be too much of a concern. Yeah. They, well, it should be. I mean, sealed bearings and all that should be maintenance-free, dot, dot, dot. Right. Um, and this goes to, you know, th we saw foldable screens yeah. uh, at CES as well, but mature technologies and mature product lines, companies every year, are <coughs> they're, they're getting weirder in the ways they're trying to di diversify yes. and, and wow us when just make the thing that we want better and we use actually better, like the image quality, <laughs> or, or, and ma or make it cheaper. I think we were arguing about a year ago about whether or not phones need to be thinner. I'm I'm tired of a thinner phone. I don't want a thinner phone. I want yeah. a phone that doesn't bend. Stay tuned for that razor. <laughs> yeah, I want a phone that does not bend on contact with reality. Right. Well, on or the, humans. On that subject, have TVs not gotten high enough resolution? 
Does does 8K matter to you? 8K doesn't matter to me. 8K doesn't matter to your eyeballs. Um, 8K matters. I I feel, and I'm using my feeling words here, and and Robert would probably be a better person to talk to. I feel that Mm. 8K is a lot like 3D in the sense that, um, you know, the manufacturers want to increase adoption, especially at the high end where most of the profits are, and 8K is the next natural evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, There is, for all intents and purposes, no 8K content. There wasn't um, 4K content to begin with. I'm sure yeah, if there's demand. Was, there was actually, you know, the, the path, you know, we barely have 4K content. A lot of what we see in, in even in uh, UHD Blu-rays is, is you know, sourced off of 2K mm-hmm. mid files. Um, that DI. Yeah. And, and the truth is, is when you when you look at the human eyeball, when you when you get into the, the, the you know, when you get into the actual physiology, contrast is way more important to the way we perceive things than pixel density is. Mm-hmm. And once you're more than a couple of feet away from the monitor, it gets really, really hard to tell the difference in terms of pixel to pixel. pixel density. I, I'm, all I'm hearing is there's a ripe opportunity for a LASIK and AKTV bundle. <laughs> 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 right. Well, it's, it's. I mean, I, I got to use a, uh, an 8K monitor a couple, three years ago. And the thing that stuck with me wasn't the fact that it... How I big could, was it? This is a Dell monitor. Yeah. 30 like, inch, yeah that big 30 was, inch yeah. Dell, you were there. 8K, and... Kind of not, especially since, well, because Windows doesn't do uh, scaling well. Right. Right. <laughs> so the, 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 but for me, what was interesting is having like 35 megapixel images in per pixel on that yeah. screen. And then because the, the pixel density was so high, it was like having that retina image experience on a massive screen. And that was much more fascinating to me than, you know, yes, you could put 37 windows on this screen and not be able to read the text in any of them if you didn't scale it up. But the actual, in terms of if you were spending a lot of time in with high resolution photography, and stuff, um, having this unbelievably dense, you know, and you know, it's it was you know it was it was an ultra sharp, so the color accuracy was super super good and stuff. But it was it was kind of crazy to be working in per pixel images with these massive massive images. And at that point, it's really you, the OS, the software, and the graphics mm-hmm. card that's your limitation, because then you're kind of everything's at a stutter's pace, yeah. not getting 60 FPS, 60 hertz yeah. consistently. Tough monitor to game on, but at well, that point you would put like a 2080 Ti into it, or now you would put a, excuse me, a, at that point a 1080 Ti today, like a 2080 Ti, run it at 4K and have the monitor scale right. it. Um, I, I see 8K really being useful in uh, situations where you're interacting with screens at a much closer distance. So yeah. Not your TV couch living situation. But mm-hmm. desktop. Like desktop or even at that bigger size, like interactive whiteboards mm-hmm. or that type of teleconferencing. Uh, the first time I u- saw 8K, I believe it was a LCD up close, uh, Sharp had one, and they basically had like a Where's Waldo and uh, image or video playing. Uh, in 8K native resolution, and you were encouraged to go up to the TV, be yeah. a foot from it, and look around for the details. Uh, that's not the way we interact with TVs, but right. it changes the opportunity for what type of interaction models we have with these you know, super high fidelity screens. Yes. Can you tell me about the new Alienware laptop? Because I, I don't understand how, how is, it's using PC parts. Yes. How is that possible? <laughs> really big power supply. Um, <laughs> I mean, literally, um, I, so th- this is not the first time, <laughs> if you're old, and I wave my hand furiously at the monitor, uh, the camera, if you're old enough, there were, back in the 90s, there were people putting desktop motherboards inside of laptops. Like the battery life on these was literally, it would boot up and then the battery would run out literally about the time Windows started. That's how <laughs> short, because these were, these were, not power sipping processors. Yeah. So what they did, again, let me point out that my CES coverage was sponsored by Dale. Yeah. Um, you know, but when you look at that that area M fifty one laptop, they are essentially have put a small, like think of like a a, a, a mini ITX scaled motherboard, mm-hmm. right? But um, it is a custom motherboard, obviously. I assume it's yeah. a custom motherboard. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, I asked nicely, but they wouldn't let me take the screwdriver to. I had an <laughs> iFixit box in my bag, and I was ready to start tearing that thing down. And 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 I won't say his name, but he looked at me like I was on crack. Um, and so the thing takes just desktop RAM, desktop it's, graphics card? It's desktop GPU. It's supposed to be shipping with a 2080. It's a desktop CPU. It's very Ben Heck project. Like just yeah, it, but cram it, a console into suitcase type of thing. But you, yeah. how do you, you don't upgrade the graphics card because it's a different form factor. No, they're telling me it's standard graphics cards. <laughs> like a standard desktop GPU. I mean, right. look, I've, I've got a mini ITX build I'm, I'm finishing up in, a, in, a, in an S4. Um, 
you know, uh, in a new S4 mini case. And the entire yeah. thing, right, I have a DC to DC power supply, an HDPlex power mm -hmm. supply, which is a 400 watt power supply that's going to run an 18X, 1800X processor. And now I may actually, I've, I, haven't, I haven't done the math yet, but I should be able to put a, a 2060 inside of that. And that's me with my staggering lack of engineering skills using yeah. off-the-shelf parts. So do with this Area 51, do you actually use the HDMI port? I mean, you must, right? Because that's it the only... It has a 17-inch monitor on it. So, but you're plugging it in, you're plugging it into a cable? Inside your laptop? You know, it, it's... It, <laughs> so, it, it's... I. I, 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 again, they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me take apart one right. that was running. That's just I don't see, I wouldn't, you know, I would imagine it would slot in or they would have a loose cable. They, right. you know, they, you know, as soon as they send me one to test, dude, you will be the first person I call to tell you how the right. HDMI is connected. Supposedly they are telling you off the shelf CPUs and GPUs will fit into this. How heavy is it? I'm guessing nine to 10 pounds. Yeah. That's no MacBook. <laughs> no, but then again, look at the performance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, best thing you saw at CES, Patrick? I, I was obsessed with that stupid LG roll-up monitor. Okay. I, I, that actually kind of fascinated like that. me. I liked it. Really? Yeah. Because, hmm. you know, one of the reasons I like my projector is because when, when I shut everything down, the screen magically rolls back up to the ceiling and there's a wall full of, of art and pictures behind it. I hear you. So that was really interesting. Um, so you have all the benefits of that with the benefits of being able to watch during the daytime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and actually I can watch during the daytime now. The projectors are bright enough that, that unless you uh, are in the corner glass ceiling to floor apartment in Miami, uh, most projectors, most decent projectors now are bright enough to deal with. You know, you, they, you, but you must put the blinds down. I mean, it makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, but not as much. It used to be you had, you to, had to. Now yeah. it's optional. If I want the best image quality, yeah, I pull the blinds down. My next projector, I probably you know, won't have to think too much about whether the blinds are up or down. Hmm. And then very um, quickly, micro LED or LCD thoughts. <coughs> is this, is this going to be a thing? Is it an OLED killer? Uh, it's, I don't, th I, you know, so that argument I was talking about before where it's, it's, you know, Samsung versus LG, it's basically OLED versus what can we do? And quantum dot technology is one thing. Micro LED is one thing. I mean, some of the, some of the, the, I want to say it was Hisense essentially sandwiched a 1080p panel behind a 4K panel and use the 1080p panel, basically a 19 by 20 panel, picture a 65 inch 1080p yeah. panel that has been fused to a 4K panel and the 1080p, so they had, you know, they had, somebody do the math for me because I'm slow today, but they basically, they had, instead of having like four, like 480 discrete dimming locations. Oh, so the, the, L, the, the 1080p panel yeah. were the lighting pixels for the backlight for the 4K display. Yeah. So instead of having, uh, yeah, it's, so you had two million discrete zones instead of four hundred and eighty discrete zones. Of so I guess behind the this panel. is just taking advantage of scale and manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Cheaper to get an yeah. OLED ten eighty panel, and then they can manufacture the panes. The, 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 yeah, but in this case, mm -hmm. it was actually they were it, it basically to increase the. One of the ways that, that LEDs are fighting OLEDs, you know, extraordinary HDR qualities is by bringing local array dimming back. And then this was kind of like the the illogical extreme, which actually, judging from what a friend of mine said, because there were engineers from other television manufacturers basically walking into that booth with in, you know, with test instruments to to take measurements to see what the performance was actually like, because they were so blown away by by what uh, what was going on there. But um, still, jury's out on micro LCD. Micro LEDs, I mean, you know, micro LEDs were showing up in Corsair's booth because they were getting more even lighting out of memory. Mm. They were showing up in television manufacturers. There's, there's, I don't think there's, I, I think having more smaller controllable LEDs uh, as a backlight is going to give you something that is, it gives you a higher performance for those. And I, I, I would assume a lot of that's going to show up everywhere if it scales well and, the, and you know, the cost is there. And, and OLED is still scaling very well right now. And it's yeah. really a question of whether people feel like the burn-in and the life lifespans are actually going to be a problem. And that's it's early to tell on that. But I mean, you know, Sony's fully committed to OLED. LG's obviously built their brand on OLED. Panasonic is re-entering, uh, you know, apparently re-entering the U.S. market with OLED. So. And, and really the places where the burn-in is going to be a problem is in public places where people are running like news channels 24 7 mm -hmm. and the Cairo runs on the bottom yeah. are, are stuck there the logos are if stuck you leave there. ESPN up for 24 hours a yeah. day if you play the same video game with the same you know or you're running Windows or desktop yeah. OS and you have fixed menu bars and yeah and we haven't seen a lot of OLED monitors we I, I haven't gotten a phone call from anybody or an email 
that says like, hey, how do I fix the burn in on my OLED yet? So I think it's probably early yet. Well, we're going to do a quick plug because uh, you will, you'll, I presume people can find all of the coverage of what you did at CES on Tech Thing. Yes, please. And so they can check that out on the Tech Thing YouTube channel or Tech YouTube. Thing. YouTube.com slash Tech Thing. Yep. T-E-K. T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G. Uh, let that close the door on CES. So let's get to our first formal segment. This week, top story this week comes out of the pop culture world, where the nominations for this year's Academy Awards were announced, and it's always a fun time to go through, talk about surprises, mm -hmm. snubs potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and have you guys gone through the list? And 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 I don't yes. know if you saw a bunch of the films. What were, what were your big takeaways from this year's crop of nominations? Ah, oh, that I haven't seen many films. <laughs> I was having the same. Uh, I I have only managed to see one Best Picture nominee. It's Black Panther. It is, and that's a big surprising, uh, deservedly there. But it is a little bit of a surprise because it was not nominated for the Golden Globes for Best Picture in dramatic category. So I think it it's up for a lot though. Like it is. it's up for Costume maybe design seven design awards. Yep, yep. It's oh, a yeah. stunning film. That's it a really lot. Is. And I th I think it's interesting that it's not up for special effects. But Infinity War is, and that's the only uh, category that Infinity War is actually nominated for. And I think that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, that's reasonable. I, I think I prefer Black Panther thematically too, but Infinity War is arguably the more important film in the MCU, and maybe even the bigger budget. I just take it back. Black Panther was nominated for Golden Globes for Best Drama, but did not win. <laughs> but it is the first superhero film. Is it the first nominated for Best Picture? No, Superman wasn't. Oh my gosh! No. Wow. <laughs> So among Black Panther, along Black, with Black Panther, you have Black Klansman, the Spike Lee film, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, which did win for Best Dramatic Picture in the Golden Globes, The Favorite, mm -hmm. Green Book, which won for Best, or was the other way around? They both won, Green Book and Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, Roma, and Star is Born, and Vice. And interestingly enough, the other milestone is that Roma was nominated for Best Picture, and that is a Netflix-produced, Netflix-exclusive mm -hmm. movie. Uh, and it, I guess it qualified because it was in theaters for a couple weeks. Oh, it dun, had to be dun, in theaters. It had to be in theaters for a couple weeks. That's interesting. Yeah, it's up for a lot of awards, too. Yes, this is the uh, the Corone film, so his first film since Gravity. And I haven't seen it yet, but it's on Netflix. And Netflix had a couple other nominations, other big surprises. The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which I loved, another exclusive, so uh, Netflix exclusive, Coen Brothers film, nominated for Best Song. Uh, didn't get nominated for Best Cinematography, which I think it deserved. Uh, but it was in a bunch of places, I believe, I believe a screenplay as well. Um, and uh, you had a lot of, a lot of familiar names in the list you know uh stars born was nominated for a bunch of picture a uh, bunch of categories including actor um, actress bradley cooper did not get a best director nomination for stars born and uh, i think that's an omission um things that may be interested interesting to our listeners best animated feature you had incredibles 2 you mm -hmm. also had into the spider verse yep isle of dogs um, in terms of costume design, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, Black Panther there as well, the favorite, Mary Poppins, which didn't get nominated for a bunch of other things, uh, and Mary Queen of Scots. So Visual uh, effects, Ready Player One. Ah, yep. Infinity War. That's right. First Man, Christopher Robin, and Solo, a Star Wars story. Yeah, First Man, not nominated for a lot of other awards in the major categories, which I think was surprising for some people. I think not enough people saw the film. Um, and I think... <laughs> Does That's the one about the Neil Armstrong. British. Oh, no. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, Best Documentary, you had a Free Solo nominated. And we've talked a bunch about that on Still Entitled. So glad to see that. No, no Mr. Rogers documentary uh, nominated for Best best Documentary Feature. So a little sad. I enjoyed that. Yeah. So how many of the Best Picture films have you seen? Uh, I have seen, because most of these came out before the baby came. I've seen most of them. I've seen have Black you? Panther, Black Klansman, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um Stars Born. Not I favorite. Have not th that came out after the baby. Because that's uh, that's up for like ten. Uh, I really Oscars. want to see that. Yeah. The same. The director of the favorite did uh, the Lobster, which you can find on Netflix. Oh, and yeah. also uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer. Both very weird films. And, uh, the Lobster is fascinating. Yeah. I heard that Vice was 
Div- divisive. Yes. I'm surprised that it's up for Best Picture, given what I heard about it. Yeah. Uh, Adam really liked it. Okay. Yeah. Good. Because it, I mean, it's got a killer cast. Yeah. And, and Adam McKay won for um, uh, The Big Short. Hmm. So, uh, th- you know, I think he's he's kind of, he, from going to pure comedies, he's doing like kind of satirical, <laughs> historical uh, donkey drum. You posted a story about theater chains who run a uh, best, you know, uh, who run a series of all the films that are nominated for Best Picture after they've been announced in a run up to the Oscars, and they were excluding Roma. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> the, the, not 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 some, but damn near all the big theater chains are boycotting Roma. And yeah. this goes into the story uh, that. This year, Roma and Ballad Buster Scruggs, these are Netflix's first right. big cinematic successes. Uh, and while they've had successes in the Emmy, or uh, yeah, the Emmys for television, Golden Globes for television, and, and streaming services have, uh, the Oscars seem to be hallowed ground mm. for, for the MPAA and for, uh, the, for Hollywood in general. And so AMC, Regal, and Cinemark, which have done um, a lot of uh, marathons and mm-hmm. re-releases of films because, like you said, a lot of people may not have seen these films in the Oscars, whether you care or care about who wins or not, uh, are a great way to surface films that came out in the past year that you may not have seen. Yeah. There's an opportunity to see them. Well, from the theater's perspective, Netflix is kind of destroying their business a little bit. And you, if people have Netflix, they probably can watch that movie at home. Although the filmmakers, it's kind of like a, a spit in the filmmakers' faces because those, a lot of those filmmakers would agree that these films are probably best enjoyed on the big screen, mm-hmm. not just the big screen in your home, in your living yeah. room, roll up or otherwise, but the big screen. Uh, you know, and, and to to say to basically to they're, they're talking via Netflix, but to say to the Coen Brothers, if you're going to work with Netflix, we're not going to let people see the Ballad of Buster Scruggs on yeah. the big screen, and we're not going to let people see Roma on the big screen. That sucks. That just seems a little whiny to me. It does. There's certainly a, a trajectory to the I'm business sorry. to the business models. The, the whole the, the theater owners being whiny is kind of tradition. I think, <laughs> admittedly, for legitimate reasons, and I think also some theaters have, have worked really hard to sort of regain the trust. I mean, but I can literally it's, it's money on the table. There's isn't yeah. it there? Embrace it. Isn't the right thing to do the, to tout and celebrate the theatrical experience and to say you may have seen you may have already seen um, not to mention great filmmaking, right? Yeah. But you may have seen either of these films on your TV or on your phone because in some people but it's a chance to rewatch them the yeah. way the filmmakers f- intended yeah, and right. really see it in a different way to celebrate films I, I, it's it, it's totally I mean it, it is totally whiny move especially given you know in terms of overall you know ticket sales I think the 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 Ollie, the, the, the the Oscar premieres is probably such a tiny segment of their business it's really petty to refuse to play it but you know they're making their their moral stand but I mean when you look at this like I think AMC's got 8,000 screens um, Regal's got you know another like 5,500 Cinemark is 4,500 I think the next largest theater chain is under 700 screens so literally like this is 20,000 theaters or theaters or 20,000 screens in the United States and they're all basically Tell I mean you know Netflix just can't win I think is what it comes down to you know I don't know they don't really no 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 no. I don't mean in terms of the awards I mean like Netflix like Comcast hates them theater owners hate them you know all the other competitors hate them consumers like them consumers like them they're going to win in the business sense yes they're going to get all the money they already have a ton of money but this is the only way the existing industry can can not give them the can hold back the one thing they it's, want legitimacy it's, it's ironic though because if they did let them show the film in the theaters people would come and pay the 15 dollars to see it in the right. theater yeah. and buy the popcorn right. if they're <laughs> pay the 45 it, if they're the making those people the go home and pay the one month subscription fee which costs the same as a movie ticket then they're going to discover how much more they can get for their money on netflix instead of the movie theater and no popcorn is sold you know, their argument, like AMC's argument, is that the film was never licensed. They didn't go through the proper channels because, you know, there's a whole behind-the-scenes negotiation that take place for what movies can appear. You know, it's not just if you release a film as a studio, it, you have the right to play it in a, a theater. It's all business, right? Deals are made. Business. It's all business. Uh, and speaking of business and Netflix and Hollywood, Netflix is now started the process of applying to be part of the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America. Mm-hmm. You know, that logo that you see in front yeah. of trailers. So I love we, the logo. We might see that in front of Netflix. Will they adopt the rating system? Right. 
the rating no. system is such a joke. But no. let's not go down that road. They might have to if they want that kind of legitimacy. It's it's a lobbying group, so like you know, it's it's to have their interests represented along mm-hmm. with Hollywood's in uh, in Washington, um, and it is another step to the perception that they are a legitimate film production studio. Yeah, along with your Warner Brothers and your Universals, uh, even though. You know, revenue-wise. I mean, it's also... Money. There's a slot opening up, right, with 20th Century Fox being bought by Disney. <laughs> yeah, I, don't think it was, it was, I don't think it's like a, it's a, a Justice League-style membership. They only have so many memberships. seats at, oh, at the, the round table. table. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's a shape like a giant film reel, <laughs> yeah. right? And Netflix is like, we don't shoot on film anymore. How about a memory card? Neither does anyone else. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Netflix, to, to stoke more fire to the flames, uh, has publicly said... They don't even see their their competitors aren't aren't the big studios. Mm-hmm. Their big rival is not even HBO. Your Amazon Prime pfft, mm-hmm. is it te- is it tested? No, no it's, <laughs> it's, it's, not, not, it's not even YouTube. Not, oh, okay, no, no. Uh, it's Fortnite. Netflix's biggest their biggest they see their biggest threat. Yeah, in for eyeballs and your right. time and your kids' time, the next generation's time, Generation Z, whatever post millennial millennials. Yeah, it's Fortnite. But about time. They saw. I mean, didn't they see this at Missile Command? I mean, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> but, but I mean that was also. But this was this was this is a conversation that people at cable companies were having twenty years ago. They were like, the internet is the competition, and video yeah. games, and yeah. and you know, and and kids doing drugs in the woods, and you know, it's it's it's. I think this is disingenuous. <laughs> like they're basically. Well, you laugh, right? But it's yeah. you know that was one of the things somebody said in a. In a conversation with a bunch of executives they shouldn't have but the uh you know and drinking and fornicating but when you when you look at when you look at like netflix saying this right now i think they're just trying to draw attention away from the fact that man it's real close to that new disney slash marvel channel and all these other studios are starting their channels and movies anywhere is out there and making it easy to to move paid movies away from the subscription model and oh my goodness you know like the cry like i love the criterion collection the criterion collection has announced that they're starting their own streaming channel with a monthly fee so one of the big things that the thing that made you know netflix so successful so fast in so many ways was it, you know a deal for the online distribution rights from stars and having all of these movies that was that were on the stars catalog and then when that deal ended you know, it was everybody bought on the hammer to beat on Netflix. And I understand why they did that, because Netflix got those 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 online reproduction rights uh, from their stars deal for basically nothing compared to what other people were paying and more power to them for finding that deal and making it happen. But now we're looking at this total diaspora where every or, or maybe, you know, return emigration where all of this, the studios like Disney's like, yeah, you, we, we can do this. We, we bought the MLB technology. We have amazing streaming technology we can bring all of our titles into our house and then gentle parent you can pay 15 to four thousand dollars to us a month for the right to stream your children's favorite movie over and over again and they can come one step closer to the every movie theaters and every record company's dream which is making you pay every time you watch a movie or see uh, or listen to a song and yeah I'm exaggerating, but literally I've been in rooms with people there where they've literally been like, you know, we'd really prefer not to ever distribute on physical media or lose the rights again. Like that, that is the dream. Right? Like the, the, the business people were so, they were, again, they're so angry at the fact that people got to buy something yeah. once and then watch and use it for indefinitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sell it. <clears throat> and, 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 and sell it. But even, even the without the selling it part, like when do we get to a point where you know, you're, you're paying, I guess we are getting there for subscriptions for video games, right? right? As opposed to buying the one game once for 60 bucks and then and then playing the entire game. Yeah. You have all forms of microtransactions and yeah. subscriptions and DLCs and season passes. Right. Because it's all about that long tail. It's, not, it's, it's, it's the revenue per user. It's the ARPU. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the you know, the, the first sale doctrine, I mean, that was fought to the Supreme Court back in 2013. Or that that finally was decided in the Supreme Court because basically somebody was like, "You, we sold it to you. You can't resell it to someone else. Someone needs to buy it fresh again from us." And I get, you know, that's that would have been a if they'd won that court case, life would have gotten a lot more expensive for everybody. But it's 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 always interesting to see the attempts to figure out new and exciting ways to get people to buy something again. Video game revenues have trumped movie revenues since long before microtransactions were you know the way that they were making their money oh dude now that they're doing it that way i think it's just skyrocketing it must be 
I, I'm, I'm curious if Bandersnatch was a response to their concern about video games and Fortnite <laughs> being you know, where the kids are spending their time. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it is a way, it's interactivity, and it's also to stop piracy because you can't, it's, it's combat piracy a little bit because you can't pirate that type of interactive media the same way. That's right. interesting. That's a really interesting right. point. People aren't going to download Banner Snatch and then recompile, you know, or leave it up to leave it up to the pirates. <laughs> Give it time. May, yeah, right. <laughs> They'll open source their own choose your own adventure software that you just drop the clips in and, and get the same thing. I wouldn't be surprised if, <laughs> if that happened. That would be pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, but we, we've talked about the elasticity of, of, of demand for for this stuff because mm-hmm. Netflix increased their prices uh, a week ago and. Uh, what is that upper limit? You know, we all have our different upper limits, but at, the, at right. one point, at some point, you're paying for however many a la carte services, and they're all increasing their prices slowly. It's going to cost more than your old cable or well, the satellite nice, subscription. The nice thing for me about that is Comcast was so out of control when I gave up on Comcast, and and Directv was so similarly out of control that I've still I've I can still basically double my media subscriptions at this point and still be a third less or half less what I was paying. Yeah, But you can only say that for so long, and then when it gets to a point where everyone has increased their prices, uh, there's no one person to blame. Yeah, You have to just say, oh, well, I at this point will stop subscribing or not to one or more of these services. It's not, you can't just point the finger at Comcast Direct TV. Right. It's everyone's to blame because everyone needs to increase their rev- revenue slowly over time. Well, yeah, and it's going to be messy. I think it's going to be painful and messy for a lot of the studios uh, and a lot of the you know the, the the television networks as they try to figure out like we're going to make you pay nine dollars a month to watch this. Well, what is your upper limit, Patrick? I don't know. Per at individual, this point. <laughs> it, it depends on the household. You know, a bachelor just out of college is not the same thing as a family of four all paying the exact same thing, yeah. doing different amounts of consuming. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and then Hulu just lowered some of its prices. Well, they lowered and raised. They decreased the price of their most popular subscription, which is the watch with ads on mobile devices, from $8 to $6. And then if you use their live TV service, they bumped that up by $5. You know, I, I gave up on Hulu so many years ago. So the idea of paying to have ads just was so delete expletive, you know, irritating. I just, I, I want to embrace Hulu, but it's just such a pain in the ass to well, watch anything on it compared to Netflix or Amazon Prime or Showtime or, 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 or. or. Um, One of the things they tried to sell, right? Because Hulu was with ads, quote unquote, free to watch on computer screens. And then they drew the line at mobile screens. <laughs> the, the way to grow their business as, as the inflection point happened and everyone, way more people are watching on their right. phones rather than on a desktop, uh, that's the thing they decided right. to charge. What are you saying? Hulu didn't chart, didn't uh, support mobile screens? What do you mean? No, I'm saying that, that they made it more difficult to watch on mobile screens. They, right. they turned the ad business into oh. a revenue <laughs> Right about plus the time everybody business. started watching on mobile screens, they, they figured out a way to make watching on mobile screens suck more on Hulu. Yeah, and cost more. Mm. And cost, yeah. period. I, <clears throat> I just subscribed to YouTube TV in, yeah. in Kishore's footsteps because I have my parents living with us for about a month and they can't survive without cable, it turns out. I had no <laughs> idea they had this addiction, but they do. Uh, we haven't had it's cable for, for ten years. They, they're watching those live sports, but it's been it's been there. It's got got it on tap. They, they're enjoying it. UTPB just expanded to now. I think believe they cover ninety eight percent of the U S. market. So whoa, uh, it is the price has gone up since the initial um, uh, introductory offering, uh, and at that price it was great. Uh, they have partnered with a little few more networks now, so I think it's a better selection. I still think it's worth it. I think they're they. As opposed to what Hulu's done with making watching on apps more difficult, YouTube TV started with a great yeah. mobile app. Oddly, you can skip commercials. I, I wasn't uh, expecting that. So the, Six accounts per household, like yeah. personal PVRs for everybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the, really the interesting thing is that you can record things, and it's I guess it's all with the licensing, but if you ought to add things to the library because it's a DVR, you have to either pre-record it by adding it to the library ahead of time or record in the moment. And if you record like halfway through, start recording halfway through a show, you only get that second half of the show. Yeah, and mu- then you can't. Skip must be a rights thing. It totally is a, it's a business. It's, yeah. a, it's a money yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, we're knee deep in pop culture news already. So let's just continue with more pop culture news. With uh, what we got? Oh, big news! Kind of sad news. The end of an era. We had a, a departure from Pixar. Director of Toy Story Three, Lee Ungrich, Lee Ungrich. and uh, Coco, mm-hmm. announced that after. Uh, 
25 years at Pixar. He's leaving to, to do something else. He goes back. He was an editor on Toy Story. I mean, yeah. way back. And then yeah. a co-director on the next two films, right? Was it A Bug's Life and Toy Story 2? He was co-director on, on films very early on. And then finally he directed Toy Story 3 and Coco. Coco's yeah. amazing. Coco is amazing. I think it's his, easily his best work. I mean, I love that film. I was the the only person I know who didn't like Toy Story 3. Uh, Why did you not like Toy Story 3? Because I felt like it was for the demographic that grew up with Toy Story rather than the new demographic that was that young. It's interesting to me because because my children enjoy the hell out of it. It's still probably Tristan's favorite Toy Story movie, but I totally get where you're coming from. You know from. what I mean? It's just, it was a little darker. I mean, this yeah. comes on the wave of you know, some interesting shakeups in the animation industry. Right. Of course, we have a uh, the big kind of uh, this, uh, controversial news, we'll say it, that uh, John Lasseter was hired by Skydance uh, to head up their animation department. Now, what have Skydance made? Skydance, uh, they, mostly live action, but they produced basically all the Star Trek films, the recent ones. Um, they did the Terminator film. Uh, they did a hmm. bunch uh, just hold on. I, I'm gonna look this up on the on the wiki. <laughs> Skydance Media, uh, Mission Impossible, all the Mission Impossibles, World War Z. Um, but animated? Anything? No, no. They, they don't exactly. So, so this, this is a, is a new, new department. New department. Oh. Skydance Animation. I mean, God. And uh, they have an inter- they did they did a VR game. They did that mech game, uh, Archangel. I mean, it's like hiring Walt Disney. So. The question is whether they are going to w- whether Lee Youngrich left because he was poached potentially. Whether mm. we'll hear news. Well, in he's a couple saying weeks. he's leaving to to spend time with his family, and everybody says I'm yes. leaving to spend time with my family. Now, he expressly said he wasn't going to work for another studio. Yeah, and mm. that was interesting to me. And that he's he's looking at backburnered projects. It's also it's like well then let's hope he just builds up his Shining fan site because <laughs> we know he's a huge fan of the Shining. The Shining. He and Adam <laughs> yeah are both obsessed <laughs> with the Shining and. Yeah. I want the creative energies that he's he, put in Pixar. He's a collector, right? He, he, he's yeah. To, yeah. He's a he's a replica prop builder. He's yeah. Oh wow. Um, he's also fifty one, well deserving of a retirement. Uh, I think that's a wonderful decision. I'm surprised he hasn't done it sooner. Well, you know, he had Coco. I'm, had, but Coco what, came what out a, a note to end a couple on. years now. I, I know, but it's like I mean, it's it, I'm, I'm with you, but yeah. it's like, you know, how many people have it's, have just last year. Well, yeah, but and there's been some cases where directors have have, really, have continued to release some amazing movies in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. But I can also see like, man, 25 years, like the craziest 25 years at Pixar. Yeah, the absolute craziest 25 years. He's you know, he's built this extraordinary movie. Um, you know, made nearly a billion dollars worldwide. I can totally be like, yeah, mic drop. Toy Story 3 made over a billion dollars. Yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking of Coco. Like yeah, Toy, yeah, yeah, right. He, Toy Story 3, he was certainly part of Toy Story 3 at the beginning, but, but you know, I think Coco is being his, like, you know, in terms of, like, his auteur, his vision. Like, yeah, man. It is this incredible story. Yes. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, the whole, this just the whole thing from beginning to end is just so epic. And I can totally see him being like, okay, I'm good. I'll, you know, when I'm inspired to, you know, when I have something that moves me at this level or that will move the audience at this level, you know, I'm sure he, he'll basically walk into a room and somebody will cut him a check to go make a movie. Yeah, but, but none of the other, no other director has done that at Pixar. Walked away? Yeah. Well, everybody, no, it's not. Because I, I seem to remember a guy who did a bunch of movies with a lot of violence and a lot of visual references. You know what at I mean? Like how Pixar? Many, how many, what are you talking about? Not at Pixar. But I mean, I'm thinking of, of Quentin Tarantino. There's There's been directors who have walked away or there's been directors who have been forced what are you out. About? Quentin's directing the next Star Trek. I understand that. But but Quentin basically like was like, I'm done. And then like 18, yeah. 20 minutes later, it was like, I'm I back. S- I see what you're saying. Um, you know, Martin Steven Scorsese. Soderberg. Yeah, yeah, you know, Soderbergh like walked away and came back. You know, Scorsese didn't walk away; he was shoved out the door uh, with a bunch of directors of his generation. But then he came back and did some of his most extraordinary work. I think I, I, if you take him at his word, he's a family man. He wants to spend time with his family, and he can. I, I think him. that people with that creative can't not be creative, and will need a, an outlet for their, their creative energies. Uh oh! Can't stop it. Can't stop it. <laughs> Adam Savage and Lee Ungridge bring you The Shining Land. Here in beautiful (laughs) Butte, Montana, you can experience The Shining on a personal level. Heretofore (laughs) never been experienced, even for the actors themselves. That's terrifying. All family and no (laughs) screenwriting make Lee a... I saw The the Shining when I was like eight, way too young. It affected me 
deeply. I understand the I, feeling. I showed my 11-year-old The Sixth Sense recently, and we didn't make it all the way through. I forgot how terrifying that film is. It's really scary. It is really scary. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, okay, let's move on to some movie trailers. Talk about three trailers that came out this week. One, John Wick, the big one. John Wick yes! 3, Parabellum. I am embarrassingly excited about this movie. Okay. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Did, and I never saw the second one. What? No, because I, I mean, I'm the, I don't know. Don't get me wrong. I, Everything that needed to be said was I said in it. the first movie. <laughs> it's, okay, I grew up, there's, there's, there's one place where suspension of disbelief still yeah. works for me. Occasionally in video games. I can't, like, you know, I can read a story, but I measure in literature. I make television. I'm always thinking about the shot and the choices of the people that are yeah. making the editing and stuff. Movies, for some reason, I turn into a gaping hole of joy at being, like, in the moment with the movie. It just happens. It's really kind of cool. It's the only place I can shut down. Um, and it's the only place I can become fully in. For whatever reason, like, all of the stuff I'm thinking about when I watch television or YouTube video or another video online, I don't do that level of, of analysis if it's a good story when I'm watching a movie, at least not the first time. So the John Wick movies for me yep. are complete. Like, they are, you know what I mean? Like, they're not even a Wawa pretzel. Like, they're not even a Philly pretzel in terms of nutrition. I get it. Like, these are, <laughs> these are you know, they, I, this right. is this is like me with a bottle of Cairo syrup being like waiting for the candy company to yeah. turn this into something that right. tastes like something is not worthy for me. Except that they're, I love, I like the whole, the, the gun foo thing, the stupid underground killer culture. Like, everything goes along with the movies. And in, in just watching, you know, the actors, like, I'll watch Ian McShane read a phone book, dude. Like Keanu Reeves, like this is the kind of stuff where Keanu Reeves becomes absolutely magnificent to watch. Um, you it's know. I like the choreography and I like the cinematography. And you're right, the a lot of the characters are really good characters. But I just I gunplay does not excite me. If this was a kung fu version of the same film, I would be so much more on board. But he hits people and he whips them around in jujitsu moves while not he's enough. shooting them. Not you enough. Know. I, I, it like, was it was the gun scenes in the Matrix that I found most boring. You know? Yeah, I can yeah. understand that. And it's also, I'll be honest with you, like, you know, pure action. Like, I can't, like, I, I'm I'm horrified because I'm like, oh, I, Bumblebee may actually be worth watching. Like, I literally have not bothered with the Transformers movie because it's like, oh, God, another Michael Bay thing. Michael Bay. You know, Michael Bay, the man who took, like, two of the best actors of their generation uh, and a really, really good backstory and turned it into, like, one of the most boring heist movies ever made. I mean, like, no, sorry if there's a lot of huge Michael Bay fans out there, but, like, yeah, I get I get it one level like endless gun battles are stupid and boring, but with the the Wick stuff it actually works for me. Yeah. I don't know why. I, mean, I would love to see the John Wick with no guns. The just the martial arts. I think John there's, I think there's the room for both. That's what I'm saying. There's there's room for both. I'm just saying once John Wick three ends, let's yeah. take the, the, the choreography and, and, and bring back the kind of martial arts movies we were that would be amazing yeah. Yeah. john wick four man with a pencil <laughs> yes john wick five and i don't mean to take anything away i've seen the videos about how well he trains for these films yes it's intense yeah props but more, more dogs attack dogs in this one yeah the that dogs, looks intense the dogs get into it yeah like dog foo i'm not sure i want to be that stuntman <laughs> yeah you probably don't no. yeah <laughs> i love dogs by the way thumbs up thumbs down oh i haven't seen it yet but and i love what's in it's on netflix i know i know i have no excuse i i will see it so uh, we mentioned last week that surprise announcement, Jason Reitman is directing a Ghostbusters sequel. Well, let's just call it Ghostbusters 3 at this right. point, right? It's, it's going to be the follow-up to the original two films mm -hmm. and in, set in that universe. And there is... Moments after our podcast. A teaser trailer. Yeah, it almost feels like a fan-made trailer. You know, it does, it's like because it uses music from the original film, yes. uses sound effects from the original films, and it, it's it's shot and the all of the special effects they just feel like they were made in 1985 or whenever that the film was. I mean, they, they feel like they're drawn. They and it has the Ecto one, but just enough of it to get you excited. But all of the effects of the sparks coming from the uh, the plasma, what is it called? The it totally could be a Spielberg proton trailer. pack, proton pack from the 80s. It feels like they care. It feels like yeah. they're tr they're true to the original special effects. The, the fanboys have spoken. Yes. It, it doesn't feel like this was something that they cobbled together because the the surprise the, the, was... I, I think all that little surprise news last week was very carefully planned by marketing, by Sony marketing. Oh, really? And because this film's shooting and coming out next year. Right. So this isn't like, yeah. you know, oh, uh, there's rumors that's happening. It's like, it's happening, and let's announce this in a way that will shock people and then have this prepared callback trailer released very soon after. Uh, 
not a proper teaser. I'd call it. It's a true teaser. Not not, not not a teaser in the uh, what yes. we've come to see Nerd. teasers as. Yes, the this mini is trailers. A this is a true teaser. Yeah, and I really dug it. I am officially teased. There you go. All right, uh, I'm super excited also for a superhero film in the DC universe coming out this year. We saw a new uh, TV trailer for it. It's Shazam. That hasn't come out yet. Man, no, hasn't come out yet. When's it come out? I believe in March. Wow. I Against Captain Marvel? That's a tough launch. <gasps> Captain Marvel is like March 7th. April, sorry. And the funny thing is that okay. Shazam is also Captain Marvel. No, like stop in it. the DC it, Comics. No, 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 it, it <laughs> Shazam make my brain name it's, it's his, the comp is Captain Marvel. Shazam is actually the name not of the okay. hero. Shazam is the name of the wizard and also the magic word he says. And when does Endgame come out? Endgame comes out in May. Okay, so we got a little bit of a break. Uh, yes. All right. I thought Shazam looked fun, man. I'm, it I'm, does. I'm, I'm down with this film. I, it's Zach Levi. Be fun to take a, your kid to. And then and there's a lot of wish fulfillment in this mm-hmm. film. There's a lot of uh, childlike wonder. Yeah. Um, the, the, the trailer actually almost riffs a little bit on some of the action scenes that we saw in Man of Steel, which, of course, we all know took itself very seriously. And so the idea is that maybe this will be that kind of same superhero's level of superpower. Yeah. Uh, but... You know, it, it's uh, it's big. It is it's big. Big plus Superman. Penny Marshall. There you go. And, and and that's not like they invented this concept for this film. It's a established, you know, character, beloved character in the DC Comics pantheon. And so I'm very looking forward to it. I'm really curious to see what Zachary Levi brings to it because he was not yeah. the first person I had in mind when they were casting this. But how does one uh, is Shazam uh, killable? What is his weakness? Uh, well, you know, Shazam is Superman's weakness because his powers are derived from magic. And Superman only has two weaknesses, kryptonite and magic. And so Shazam's weakness is that he has a mind you of a child. No. And so if he is uh, not in full Shazam mode. By saying the word Shazam. Yes, he's mm-hmm. in child mode. He can be subdued. So, But as Shazam. As Shazam, he is as powerful as Superman. So basically to kill Shazam, you gotta Superman's make him got to kill a child. But he's not <laughs> yes. vulnerable to, to kryptonite. He's obviously, not, no, no, because he was born he here on the, yeah. on Earth. Yes, yeah, he can be wow. punched, right? <laughs> you could, there, there are other superpower beings that you know, a fist fight. You have to right. You know, this is starting to feel like the conversation I had with my kids recently, trying to explain the Marvel reboots. Oh, oh, have you listened to our podcast? There is, a, we have a segment <laughs> of calm explaining for Jeremy. <laughs> and, no, but it's like I was, I, I'm still like I'm. I never read a lot of the superhero comics growing up, and uh, I came into comics by way of indie comics, um, like Love and Rockets, and then worked my way back to other stuff. But it's you know trying to explain like how there can be multiple like you know into the Spider Verse from the boys. We're like, but wait, that, yeah. like just enjoy it. Someone on the YouTube comments uh, suggested la- this after last week's show that I know nothing about pop culture. <laughs> suggested, yeah, like, exactly. posited. Well, jokes on from, them from listening to food to. Th- the 400 episodes of This Only a Test, I have now deduced Jeremy knows nothing yeah. about pop culture. Well, I say to them, joke's on you because I know nothing about tech either. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, one final trailer do you want to talk about, uh, Brightburn. Have you seen this? Brightburn. No. Okay, I'm going to talk about the trailer while you guys should watch it. Okay. And you don't need the audio to watch it. But it is produced by James Gunn, so it's already noteworthy that way and that it's his first um, film project that he's been attached to and it's coming out post him being let go by Disney slash Marvel, uh, being directed by one of his collaborators, uh, David uh, Yurovsky, uh, who I believe was, a, uh, who was uh, an editor, I want to say, on uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. No, not an editor. What was he? He was a producer? He had done some work with James Gunn related to Guardians of the Galaxy. But this is a, a new genre of superhero film. Uh, and the trailer... What does that mean? Well, you, you'll see. It's Elizabeth Banks. Um, it opens up a family uh, in... It looks like Kansas in, mm-hmm. in middle America. Feels very Superman. Uh, wants, yeah, uh, they, they, they're desperate for a child. And uh, as luck would befall them, a crashed ship one day falls onto their property and they find a baby and this baby is quite extraordinary. And the trailer Still even, feeling like Superman. This trailer completely riffs off of Man of Steel's trailer mm-hmm. from the visionary director, James Gunn of Guardians of the Galaxy. They go even the same type of title, cards, and credits. This is uh, directed by James Gunn? No, it's no. produced by. Oh, okay. He, he is, a t- I mean, who knows how involved did, he was. Did he start this production after he was let go? This I, is an impressively long trailer. I, I, I think so. Huh. Um, 
and oh, I can't wait till we're gonna have a real moment here. You're excited? Best, about I'm that? excited for your reaction to it. I, oh, I'm really? excited for this as well because th- th- I was I, I watched Cold mm-hmm. and it was the the idea was very tantalizing. Okay, she's walking me. through the laundry. She's walking through the laundry. Uh, there's some in a shed, something under the floorboards. <laughs> Dad is upset. People people start getting upset. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I show me the boy's face. Oh God! Oh God! Stop it! This is not one you take your kids to. No, it's not. <laughs> it turns out to be uh-huh. a horror film. Yeah, I'll say. It is what would happen if the Superman, the baby from another world, with the Superman powers, was evil. Evil. Oh, the Omen. Sign of the times. People love evil people now. It's a superhero horror film. Oh, wow. This is getting a little shiny it, it, here. It's, it's yeah. Here's Johnny. <laughs> it's terrifying. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. No, that's horrible. This, this game over, man. You can't yeah. fight that, baby. No. I, it, that's that's how, 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 Shazam! how does that movie end? Shazam! Shazam! <laughs> how, how does that movie end? Yeah. Right? Like this child, it, it could not end well. No. When you have a, a, a crazy serial killer who's also a child with superpowers. It'll be like a Werner Herzog movie where everyone feels dirty and sad at the end when they leave the theater. Did you guys see Chronicle? <laughs> no. no. That film? Oh, I recommend that. Okay. Um, it's uh, oh, um, written by Max Landis, uh, directed by the guy who then went on to direct a Fantastic Four film, but it's a uh, found footage film about three kids, and uh, Michael B. Johnson's in it. It was uh, one of his first big movie roles um, hmm. uh, before uh, the, the the Bart movie and um, and Black Panther, of course. But uh, it's about three kids in middle America who get superpowers. Chronicle. Chronicle. Okay. Highly recommended. Very cool. Um, but it has, has a similar tone All right. to this. Um I think that does it for pop culture news. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, I want to let you know that the uh, this episode it's of This Only Test is also made possible by Lutron uh, Caseda Smart Lighting System. Uh, Caseda by Lutron takes your smart speaker, Alexa, Google Home, Apple HomePod, and makes it more powerful by letting you control your lights with your voice. Caseda is the most connected smart lighting brand and it works with more smart home devices than any other smart lighting brand, letting you pair your lights with things like security devices, thermostats, and music systems like Nest, Sonos, and more. Because it's from Lutron, you can also rest easy knowing that it will just work. And with Caseda, you can schedule your lights to come on at dusk so your family always comes back to a well-lit home, I have it set up in the nursery so that when I have a baby in one hand and bottle in the other hand, or maybe even dog in the other hand, I can just use my voice <laughs> to dim the lights and so the baby won't go nuts. What, so you can get smart lighting the smart way with Caseda by Lutron. Um, go uh, search for Caseda, that's C-A-S-E-T-A, or check out Lutron.com to learn more. Caseda by Lutron. Welcome home to Peace of Mind. <laughs> All righty. Mm-hmm. So we did a bunch of uh, a bunch of tech news already. Oh my God, my show notes just did we? disappeared. Did we? Did we? Well, we talked about CES a bunch. Dip our toe in here. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. What's wrong? I lost all of my show notes. I have no idea. Jeremy, you got to lead us in. Oh no, nope, nope. Control Let- Shift T. Uh, <laughs> what's that do? Is that reopen tab? Reopen your closed tabs. Nicely done. Control Shift T. It's 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 very useful. It's one of my favorite, li- it. less known. It's an undo that shortcuts. It's to kill all undos. It's wonderful. yeah yeah yeah. Um, so uh, assuming for people who watch this on YouTube, you you watch your content on YouTube. Uh, one of the channels that you might have subscribed to was Machinima. 
Mm-hmm. We're big fans of Machinima. They were one of the, the massive YouTube channel, one of the first ones who did um, lots of game coverage, Let's Plays, you know, kind of really exploded. It used to be um, about Machinima. It used to be about, yeah, the, the word Machinima is about animation. It's really. about making, like, storytelling within game engines. Yes, yeah. using things like, what was the first Machinima you, you saw? Red versus Blue, Blue maybe? Yeah. I mean, that was a big one. I don't know if it was the first. I saw some, like, Quake 1 Machinima. Quake 1. That was pretty funny. Quake 2 was my first Machinima and that was when you would download maps, <laughs> download assets, mm-hmm. like textures, you and models. You had to watch them like real time? And, and you could render it and play it on your own computer. Like a demo. Like it was, you played a yeah. demo and you'd have voice, there'd be wave files Whoa. with voice acting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's neat. There was a whole like sitcom that I yeah. downloaded and played in Quake. And it was all, it wasn't, it didn't look like photorealistic, of course. It was also Quake textures. Right. So it'd still like be the Quake guy walking around. Yeah, but no, comp- around, no compression artifacts. But, but it would be at running at a glorious resolution yeah. of 1024 by 768. Whatever you got. <laughs> and, um, and I thought that was the future. I was like, this is how we're going to watch animation yeah. going forward. It's how animation is going to happen. I wanted to make a tool. Like after watching Machinima, I was like, there should be a game engine that's made for making movies like in real time. <laughs> like, well, Quake 3, what uh, I believe um, Anna Kang uh, did uh, from id Software was create uh, Machinima tools with Quake and, oh, and made a short film yeah. using right. Quake, Quake 3. Yeah. Um, and w- back with the Quake 2 stuff, uh, the way they would film this stuff was all like ghost cameras. You would have like another player in a multiplayer match essentially, yeah. like stand off, and they would call in and get people from the community to be extras. Right. Like we'd all jump in, eight players, and give people roles. And you would act. But the problem was the camera was always limited to whatever yes. the game, whatever served the game. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah. the field of view and FOV and like all, oh, all the that movements, stuff. Yeah. And yeah, and like your camera movements would be WASD and, and you wouldn't get fancy camera moves. There wasn't VR filmmaking. Right. But Machinima, to some extent, is the, the idea of rendering real-time assets is what is happening with VR filmmaking. Right, like oh yeah, no, I've told Will you've now made that tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you animate in real time, and you bring digital characters that have have that previously would have been hand framed animated, and and still to this day, it plays the Pixar are hand frame and frame by frame hand animated. Uh, you can do that with positional capture, with performance capture, essentially. They do keyframe. Yes, they do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but machine with the website. Yes, different. Different, <laughs> born out of that. I started for that tangent. We went through a, a nostalgic deep dive. It's important. It's the yes, word. Yes. Words mean uh, something. The, the site, the YouTube channel went yeah. dark. Is it still dark? It is still dark. It went private. What and that, all of their partners or? and all of their videos basically are gone, which is, that's kind of a big deal. It, it, I mean, we think of these institutions um, on the internet. You know, the websites and big YouTube channels mm-hmm. and, um, and, and and just big brands that we have grown to love and the people we follow as like because it's on the Internet, because we have infinite media and infinite storage, these it will be a repository for all content forever. That's just not the case. It's especially tricky with YouTube because that content is so hard to back up. It's expensive. Yeah. To yeah. Back up. And you just trust these companies like Google and YouTube to to hold on to it. Yeah. And oh, it's they're not, still it, holding on to it. It's still sitting there. <laughs> right, and it's it's not the Google and YouTube. It's whoever owns the content right yeah. now that yeah. you know chooses. To. But you, like you had, ar- you have archive.org for s- traditional websites, and a lot of yeah. images are backed up right. there as well as the HTML. But it, 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 it varies a lot because the other thing is, is a yeah. lot of the. It's been interesting because because people have told me that a lot of what content or uh, uh, archive.org backs up, like we don't have access to the vast majority of what it's scraped, and. You know, the experience, having spent a bunch of time, especially in some stories I worked on like a year ago where I was tracing back what companies said about their products at different times. Yeah. It's interesting to see what does kind of get or how deep it goes in certain websites and mm-hmm. stuff. But when you look at, when you look at, you know, content creators who've maybe been running four, five, six, seven years, who've been doing, have gone from maybe a video a week to three to five videos a week, uh, if they haven't archived their stuff or if they thought of YouTube as their archive, if they went with an MVNO and the MVNO, Basically, it's you know, what's, it's, what's that? 
uh, it, you know, I can never remember the initials. Basically, it means like signing with somebody who they're they're <laughs> they're going to grow your channel and provide you better advertising rates than YouTube does in exchange for it's it's basically the the, the record company model Got shifted it. to to YouTube. Um, that's the kindest thing I can say about it in public. But and MVNOs have worked for some people, but mostly. It was really hysterical when when tech thing first started to grow. We we got a lot of emails from like you know, hey, I'm a big fan of your channel. We could really help you grow and give you the advertising dollars you need. And I'm like, dude, that's actually less than what YouTube pays per you know thousand views. And why would I sign over my ownership rights to you know some guy that you know found me on the internet? But um, yeah, it's like their their whole response in this was. You know, we are focused on creating new content with the Machinima team, which will be distributed on new channels to be announced in the coming months. In the meantime, the Machinima network of creator channels continues to showcase the talents of the network. As part of this focus on new content, we have pivoted from distributing content on a handful of legacy operated channels, period. And I'm like, wow. They're basically like, that's that's the, that's the, like, they could have thrown a couple more sentences in there to obfuscate it more. But that's basically like, yeah, we ain't doing YouTube no more. Thanks. Bye. And also, um, you know, maybe... The subtext and what I read is that they're they don't want to deal with the the benefits or the liabilities yeah. of library of content on platforms that weren't regulated and have matured, right? Content ID mm -hmm. and sponsorships and all that stuff has has changed kind of the landscape of what it means to be a business on YouTube. Yeah, and you know there is a lot of liability when a company picks up a, um, a catalog of content. I mean, having talked to a bunch of YouTube creators, and I was at, I want to say VidCon last year, it was amazing to hear like the stories of what happened to a lot of these larger networks, um, you know, to their their ad revenue after PewDiePie's, you know, <laughs> PewDiePie makes inappropriate humor and YouTube loses 50% of its revenue in the adpocalypse and the challenges that a lot of these companies had. Like, oh, we went through a story where this, 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 company that basically aggregates or this channel that aggregated video kind of like America's funniest home videos except for YouTube and they would like purchase the rights and host the video and they had like some crazy number like 30% of their content was flagged basically overnight and one of it was you know they're like okay we have a pigeon behaving weirdly before jumping off the side of this building like why why was this flagged and then it working out that like you know you know it, Pigeon jumping sounded like person jumping, and person jumping would be something that, you know, would be suicide, which advertisers wouldn't want to be there. And they literally had to, like, go through in some cases and individually kind of like, no, 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 this, this is what it's actually about. And then, you know, their YouTube contact being like, well, perhaps you could change the title to this. And, like, it's just, it's, you know, they have all of these creators, all of these contracts, all of this content, a wildly fluctuating, you know, it's, it's got to be difficult to predict the value uh, of this, depending on like, you know, are any of these old videos still being watched? You know, are they making any money off of them? Do they want to deal with the trouble? But it's also really brutal because, yeah, people's entire catalogs just like pff, vaporized. Um, like GeoCities all over again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not, that's, that's a pretty uh, apt analogy. And, and it, it reminds us of how ephemeral all of this, this stuff is. And like, we think of media as being permanent and being documents of record. Right. And it's never been the case. Old TV shows, old, old news footage, like, you know, there, there is no microfiche for, for video. <laughs> well, there is. It's like a, a DVD or a Blu-ray, but online video, it's like- Someone's gotta be saving it. Yeah, and saving it in the place where if the hard drive crashes, you don't lose all of it. Back I mean, up, three, two, one. <laughs> that's a big undertaking. Yeah, yeah. Everything will come to an end. At some point, tested will come to an end. At some point, I'm just saying, right? Like that's a scary thought. I think that's like—is that a teaser? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, like <laughs> one last story the, before we go. The mortality <laughs> of like these yeah. things, like you know, they're they're just businesses, and yeah. and uh, yeah, they're real people behind it, and you know, those the memories will still be there, but like nothing lasts forever. That's right. But I think for a lot of people, except the, Nintendo, network hundred year plan, NAS box. Yeah. Well, a hundred year plan and like several, you know, enough, uh, so enough billions in the bank for Nintendo that they could basically, they could have made no money off of the Switch and they'd still only have 46 years to figure out how to make more money before they ran out of money. <laughs> like that was like one of the hysterical business analysis I ever read. But it's also for a lot of people in the YouTube generation, this may be the first time a lot of their favorite content disappeared. And that's something that's a very kind of novel idea if you've, if you're used to a video being posted at this scale on YouTube. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, at a place where it was easily accessible. Yeah. 
know, it's, it's not like you only have to wait three years until the show goes into reruns on some UHF channel you never right. watch except to watch the rerun of your favorite show that was on CBS, NBC, or ABC five years ago. It's kind of like what you know, the day Simpsons will be canceled. What if Simpsons was canceled? Fe- like the feeling it would be if Simpsons was canceled and the entire catalog of Simpsons was no longer accessible. Poof. That's how that's that's the kind of feeling. It's, it, it's different than that. <laughs> you can get the entire Simpsons collection on DVD. Right. You can, this Blu-ray. is even worse because yeah. it's it's abruptly. But all imagine gone. if magically all of the copies of the DVDs and Blueberries disappeared. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's a serious kind of magic. That Thanos like that, snaps his fingers. That scary movie you just made me watch. <laughs> Dusted. So, do you have an iPhone? Uh, not currently, although I'm, I'm, I'm rapidly, as much as I don't want to pay the price of a new iPhone, which yeah. is why I have a Moto G6 right now, uh, I, there's some profoundly frustrating things about, uh, Android that is actually has me thinking about just breaking down and buying a new iPhone. Well, if you had an iPhone, you'd be able to take part in Apple's new contest. Anybody who has an iPhone can take a picture. I feel so excluded. Post it to Twitter. I should sue. Tag it with shot on iPhone. <laughs> And your picture might end up on a billboard. I see so many problems with this. First of all, good for them as a marketing exercise. Brilliant plan because a shot on iPhone ad campaign is one of the most successful things they've done in years. Well, yeah. In, in, in terms of advertising and promoting their product, right? They took so, one of the killer functionalities of their phone, your yeah. messaging being one, photography being the other. They, they have hundreds if not thousands of people working on just the camera systems on their right. phones. They know this is one of the reasons people upgrade and buy phones, any smartphone for that matter. They built an ad campaign about what people do and basically UGC'd their way into a, into the next. Did they though? Because the first time, who knew? Who knows where those photos came from? They certain, I'm sure that they came from iPhone users, but they weren't solicited. They were not. They found them on Flickr. In, in, in many cases, uh, okay, to talk so, about how dated they were, yeah. people like <laughs> remember Flickr. Yeah, yeah, they, they would be credited on on the oh, uh, right. yeah, yes. and, and you would find like Flickr links, yeah. and they would be Creative Commons license, or they'd reach out. Um, yeah. Either way, I've never heard of anyone who had their photo used being compensated, and that is exactly the case here no, because only fame. They they're they're promising exposure for ten amateur photographers or professional photographers, uh, and they have a panel of judges. They're making this big contest campaign out of it. And I don't know if that's a legal reason why they can't give it's money like the away. Bachelor. Well, they don't but have to give money away. Career. I think it's just wrong for them not to offer any other incentive and just rely on quote unquote really? exposure and goodwill. How it, many how many shareware projects got sucked into like I'm thinking back going back to like OS six. Like how many software how many shareware projects did don't they make kill? a right. Okay. Yeah, I'm not saying it's right, but it's not like it's novel behavior from Apple. So it, the contest lasts from January 22nd, two days ago, uh, three days ago as of this release of this podcast, to February 7th. So it's, it's a very short couple window. weeks. I mean, sure, it's because the number of photos that will be it's submitted be a lot. is a lot. So one, post who, a tw- is, what? who's doing this? Like, who's, who's sifting who? through? What are you talking about? Oh, who are the, who's, who's sifting? Who's interns. finding the photos? <laughs> Unpaid interns. Right? <laughs> And then, because there's a panel of I'm judges, sure including well, like Austin Mann, and, and you can and also Phil email Schiller. them. You can also email the photo to you know shot on iPhone at apple.com. It has to be named a certain way, and it's your name in the title. I hope that, that and then your learning. iPhone model. Machine learning. They're going to use machine learning to pick out the best photos. Also, the other thing I have a problem. Let's just say from yeah. a technical aspect, is this Twitter compress your already non DSLR photo. No, no, they won't on, use on, that one. Oh, they'll reach out and yeah, of get, course your, they will. get your of course source. They will. Oh, they'll just dig well, into they, your they iPhone, iCloud actually, account and, and <laughs> take the photo. Take Guess what? That one's compressed as well because <laughs> iCloud compresses your photo. <laughs> no, no, no. Th- I think that they would probably reach out to you and, and get the good one. If and make you, you sign e- the contract. If you email it, it has to be the raw one off your phone. <laughs> they don't need to reach out because by even using the hashtag and submitting, you've Follow yes. their terms of usage That's for the right. contest and given up your right to commercially exploit your own photo for a year. One year. Oh, and, that's actually and, and you give them a year is quite reasonable. By, I, I by thought the so too. <laughs> what? No, no. No, I'm not saying. But I mean, given the number of things where you give up your right in perpetuity, or you give up. I oh mean, no, they gave up their their rights in perpetuity. I mean, for Apple to use this photo in marketing, right. it's just that you give up the additional right for a year to sell your photo anywhere else. Yeah, that's. I mean, I honestly, I don't. The uh, rights, the rights deals these days are usually so 
bad for creators. That actually sounds only giving the the the, the revenue rights up for a year seems kind of reasonable by comparison. I just think Apple could at least throw in like MacBook Pros. You know, they only got like what one hundred and fifty billion dollars right? salted away. It in doesn't their... matter, man. It does if the idea. And I, I know it's, the, there's it's an argument. Gonna, it's not going to affect are saying, it. You contest. think creators should be compensated for their work? <laughs> You you really should not drink coffee. But you're actually that's a very idealistic moment, and I'm I'm fe- I'm feeling nasty and cynical right now. But it's like when one of the crazy things is like just the the it's brutal and it, and it's 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 kind of pathetic. Because I'm sitting here like, oh, they're only taking away your right to make a living off of that photo for a year is so reasonable by the standards of these things. Most of these things are like. You know, again, they're like 60s records contracts where it's like, you know, we're going to make you famous, kid, but you're going to owe us six albums, 90 percent of the revenue and 50 percent of your tour merch. Um, you know, it's like I agree. Everybody, people should be paid for their work. But like, A- look, Apple and, and the strawman argument here is that, oh, if you uh, if you offer up money, then professionals will want to do this and it'll take away from the amateur aspect of the whole campaign. It's amateur photographers. No. You're you're still uh, there's so many people who are am- the line between amateur yeah. and pro is is so thin now, and if the idea is to celebrate yeah. the work of people who are using your products and, and love your products in an interesting way, you know, give back a little bit, yeah. even just a gear, right? Like you don't have to use Lightroom, use whatever Aperture, but give them MacBook Pro so they can become professional photographers. But this, I mean, this is also a classic Apple moment where it's, you know, they are so big and so important and they are so, you know, self-actualized in their own perverse way that why would anybody want anything other than our blessing to know that their photography is considered good enough for an you Apple guys, campaign? You guys are being too hard on this. They, look, Apple does not care about 10 MacBook Pros. They don't even know, they, that's a, <laughs> true. they wouldn't notice that. <laughs> it's an inventory. They wouldn't uh, even know what a proper <laughs> yeah. re- award would be. It's like, should that's it be not 10, an excuse. $10,000? That means nothing uh, to us. They do know exactly what the award should be because they pay their marketing companies and their advertising companies yeah. pay license fees when they license photos and when they pay yeah. cinematographers to make what I'm saying is the, it's not a money issue. Apple's not being frugal here and cheap. They they just they haven't done it for whatever reason. And I don't think that it's necessarily <laughs> bad. If I w- submitted a photo to Twitter shot on iPhone and it ended up on a billboard, I'd be proud as heck. I'd show the thing off to all my friends and that would be the end of it. You know, it's not a huge deal. They don't. If they're not going to do that, they're not going to do it. And this doesn't change anything. At, at my, my best, problem it's a missed opportunity. with this contest is that they allow you to edit the photos. You can edit all you want in Lightroom, in Photoshop, wherever you choose. And they can't track. And the other thing with the Twitter thing is how they know. Is there EXIF data on the compressed (laughs) Twitter image that let you know it was shot from iPhone? I would love for the winner for this to be shot on Android and Apple not realizing it. You would love that? That would be the the equivalent of the tweeted on iPhone (laughs) <laughs> for for photos, just edit the metadata. And yeah, just make like it reaching look like my bag for my A six thousand. Well, you can go on Twitter, search for the hashtag. There's already some pretty damn good photos out there. Nothing I can compete with. That's th- and and that's the real success of this campaign. It's to spread that hashtag, and I, I will be doing that because it's it's a good point. Where I, I want to check out what other people have photographed on their iPhone, get some inspiration. It always blows me away what some people manage to pull off with any camera, anywhere, anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's uh, quickly go through the rest of the news because we were running a little bit low on time. Microsoft, a couple bits of news from there. Yep. Speaking of uh, phones, mm-hmm. they've kind of given up on Windows Phone, and they're either just telling users, hey, switch to iOS There's a support or document. Android. There's a support document that says switch to iOS or Android. That's the solution to your problem. Yeah. If you have a, wind- a Windows Phone, they will it will stop receiving security updates this year, December 10th. You know, they, they get props for having supported the platform for as long as they have. Okay. Yep. How diligent do you think that security personnel is going to be between now and December 10th? Pretty diligent if they ever want to continue working for any of the departments that are growing right. at Microsoft. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so uh, the other news is that Microsoft also is selling uh, a cheaper version of their stylus. Now, it's targeted for the Surface Go, which was the cheap version of the Surface you know, for classrooms last right. year, kind of a competitor to what Apple did with their education version of the iPad uh, and discount pricing there, and also that Logitech's uh, Apple Pencil mm-hmm. um, alternative. Uh, except this one uh, is the, the Microsoft Classroom pen, still first party, and you can only buy it in packs of 20 sold exclusively to education institutions.
substitutions. 40 bucks per pen for uh, a pack of 20, so $800 for a pack of 20. And the cool thing, though, is that it will work with other Surface devices. So really, it, it's Microsoft wanting to get Surface into the classroom, into colleges, and um, and I think you know if, if you if you walk around, there's I see a lot more Surface laptops, and You're Surface a fan? Pros. I'm a big fan. I'm using one right now uh, than than I d- than I did previously in San Francisco. San Francisco, okay, yeah, because they're still compared to entry level Ultrabooks. <laughs> entry level Ultrabook <laughs> come, is come be, to the East Bay. The yeah. story changes a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know but, the the base iPad Pro is like a thousand dollars. iPad Pro, yeah. I was yes. surprised by that. I thought it was like in the hundreds because I have not mm-hmm. been paying attention. No, they raised the price because they made it more premium. Actually, they, 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 and Amazon just had a sale on those, like $100 off. But whatever. Um, the bravest news story this week. The bravest thing done. Maizu. Yeah. Chinese smartphone company uh-huh. has now made a smartphone with no ports <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> so brave. So brave. That's Apple talk. So... Not only does it not have a headphone jack, Mm -hmm. it doesn't even have a charging port Mm -hmm. or a speaker grill or a SIM card slot. No speaker. No speaker. Bluetooth. Why not? It's so... (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Okay. All it has is a pinhole for a microphone and a pinhole for a hard reset. I do love the fact that they have to leave the pin. They couldn't figure out a way to get rid of yeah. the pinhole for the hard reset. Yeah. <laughs> charge, uh, you charge it wirelessly. Mm-hmm. Bluetooth 5.0 for wireless and wirelessly USB connectivity. And the screen will actually act as a speaker, a la Sony's televisions, where the glass yes. radiates. The it audio. does. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't think it's so going to be. So a you can use it as experience. a handset. Right. But there is no no holes. So brave. Now. No wait a minute. Is it a. A t- like a phone speaker, or is it like a speakerphone speaker? No. It is. It is a. It is. It is the speaker for the phone. Yeah. is actually the screen that you hold to your ear, or that you have a speakerphone. I haven't used with? it yet myself, but it sounds like you hold the phone to your ear. Okay, or basically, or you know, instead of having speaker holes, it the actual screen vibrates yeah. to move airwaves towards your ear balls. Fascinating. I think it's a little bit extreme, but they're going this far in as a, a, a demonstration of technology. And it will be, I guess, for sale. It's called the Zero, and wireless USB as fast as USB three. Yeah, I, I think it, this is as as far fetched as the sound and as silly as the sound. I would not be surprised if this is a path that Apple takes. Not maybe not all the way to a point mm-hmm. where they won't even speaker reel, speaker reels, but like no a port. charge port yeah. is probably the next thing right. to go. You know, headphone jack. Then charge port because once they figure out that the air pad situation, whatever it's called, the charge pad mm-hmm. uh, situation, wireless charging at scale, uh, it, it, for them it probably makes more sense. Is that money on the table though? Because they get uh, royalties every time somebody includes a license, a, yeah, uh, a lightning iPhone. adapter. Yeah, they'll they'll get royalties off the charging devices, the or maybe they devices. won't license the charging devices out for a while, and they'll make more money on the charging devices than they do on the cables. I have faith in. In and Apple's ability to make money. Yeah, I mean, although, I, and, but that said, you know, they their their sales are down. They've Wall Street kind of kicked them in the teeth recently. Um, I mean, part of what's crazy for me about this this phone is like the companies, the companies like launching in retail in China, but so few Chinese carriers support eSIMs that right. they literally they're they're gated by the number of carriers that can actually support the built-in SIM technology. Hmm. That probably is the next thing they go, the SIM card. Now yeah. to think of it, before the, the charging port. But it, we're, we're moving closer and closer. Uh, Amazon, mm-hmm. can't get away from Amazon. See that story that the, uh, from Gizmodo, one of the writers, tried to live without any Amazon services touching her, her life experiences, okay. and it's not possible. Not possible. Like Amazon S3 everywhere. Like oh. Amazon, you can't, can't get away from it. Y- yeah, gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you'd stop using Amazon Prime pretty quickly. Yeah. But... Well, Amazon will soon be chasing you down the street with their Scout robot that they're now testing uh, in, uh, where is this, in, in Washington? Oh, it's cute. Let's put some googly eyes on Look it, right? Look at that. That's, that's the, that's the, uh, and it's a battery-powered robot that will safely deal with obstacles like pedestrians and pets and, deli- and, and, drop in some pa- and deliver some packages, pop its lid open and <laughs> drop out an Amazon box. All I can think of is... 
is people with crowbars figuring out how to pop those things open. Like how long is it? How long before the security flaw shows up or the yeah. physical flaw shows up and people start ripping those off? Yeah, Amazon is completely oblivious to criminal activity. I don't think they're oblivious. They are, dude. I, they they I, wouldn't have designed their courier system the way that they did. They, they have received so little training on where yeah. how to leave packages. I, no, 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 no. I think they're fully aware of it. I don't think they care because of the volume <laughs> that they do. <laughs> you misunderstand me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, their solution is to get in your home, right? Their solution is to have you use their uh, uh, car locking system, their garage door opening system. Yeah. You know, you're you're they, not gonna were, do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that amount of convenience. I mean, it, it, I'm also. I mean, it's also. I mean, it's it's always funny to see different sort of weird evolutions in Amazon's delivery. Because my personal favorite was still when they started having, you know, drivers or warehouse workers. I guess would optionally be able, or they just hired really inexpensive. Uh, op- they had opportunities to hire really it just I just remember like a like a like a, a Honda of a certain age missing a certain amount of its paint screeched to a stop in front of my house the window was down somebody yelled out are you Norton and I'm sitting here and I'm like full flight or fight mode in like seconds because it was really aggressive and I'm like yeah and literally an Amazon package flew out of the window hit me on the chest I caught it before I hit the ground and they took off and I was just like that happened that just happened, and I really wish I had a camera rolling. So they're certainly on the cutting edge of figuring out how to reduce sh- shipment costs. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> they are good at that. All right, a uh, little bit of a fun story. We got some thoughts from John Carmack on Twitter. He pontificates from time to time with interesting experimental ideas, uh, things he's been thinking about. And recently, audio is something he's been thinking about, not necessarily as it pertains to VR, but classic video games he tweeted it would be interesting to see experimental audio only upgrades to classic games to probe how much impact can be made especially essentially given the unlimited quality and diversity huh then dynamic music playback uh, improved yeah. pac-man and I, and I would answer there is already a pac-man version that has really great music and that's like the, the pac-man championship edition yeah but he's talking about same graphics I imagine he's talking about same gameplay, same controls, same graphics, just upgraded audio. And what type of audio is he talking about? Positional audio or just like would, I like just want to hear soundtrack. Flight of the Valkyries every time Pac-Man needs a power pellet. Sky's the <laughs> limit. You know, he talks about he talks about a dynamic soundtrack. So it would change based on how many ghosts are blue, based on, you know, who's close to you, right. you know, based on how how far away you are from the last pellet, things like that to amp it up, amp up the drama. I mean, at, at that point it would be the disassociation would be that the graphics are so low fidelity yeah. that why not just make it look a little bit better? Like that would, but you I, can't I think, test for, this I think for him, this is like a Gedenkins experiment where he's, he's looking at as somebody who has been classically obsessed with visuals and don't get me wrong. Like going back to quake, I have happy things to say about horrible sound effects in the man's games, but I think he's, you know, I don't know if he was, you know, was he sitting in a movie one day and realizing that he wasn't really responding to the images, but he was responding to the soundtrack, and then he starts pulling that into the gaming universe? I mean, it's a really, it's a really curious concept. I, I would mean, say Tetris Effect. That's your answer right there. Same visuals. It's same, not the same visual. Do you know what? It's, it's same it's, gameplay. It's, same gameplay, yeah. but sound is a huge part of it. Yes, that's true. And that's so, true. But imagine that sound on the Game Boy. So is he, is he asking about... It has to be like a, an upgrade, like the exact same experience except for audio. I'm imagining. And I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought experiment, you mm. know, because there are a lot of great games, Defender, you know, Tempest, Robotron. I wonder what they would sound like yeah. with some upgraded audio, like completely sky's the limit audio And who is the unbiased tester? New is kids. it someone who's never played that game yes. before? Well, that actually shouldn't be that hard to find. So for them, image. it would just be like, they would just see that disconnect between the image and the video. I mean, think and, about and, it. Like double-blind laboratory testing, like full-on college, you know, graduate program where they yank in a bunch of people. Have you ever played this video game? Yeah. Or could you identify this? You know, and then if they say no, then they go in and they, you know, they, they strap them into an EKG and, <laughs> you, you know, have them play the game. I bet he's got a point because music does, it's like they say with, with movies, uh, uh Audio is seventy percent of what you see. You know, I think that they probably have the same experience with games. It's. I mean, uh, I don't uh, think Steve Lynn and Mike Micah are the target audience for this kind right. of thing. You know, I mean, I right. think uh, there's a lot of purists who would be offended by this. Absolutely, and there's a nice um, synergy between the crunchy sound effects of the '80s with the graphics. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
I'm wondering in the same vein, like where if you take this thought experiment a, a step further, what's the other thing? You, you improve the visuals, but have the janky gameplay, or, or keep the from same movies. keep the same gameplay, keep the same audio, and just improve the controls, like smooth out, higher frame rate, more responsive. But I think classic games, like arcade games in particular, were designed around the controls. I don't think it came; it was game first. Mm. You know that they're so well tuned to one another. I think the the trick is to actually is remaking the controls themselves. Got it. Uh, okay, uh, on to more music. Spotify. I think they actually just launched this. They finally added the feature that lets you mute artists. Block Title needs that artists. so bad. What does that mean? <laughs> it, it means uh, when you like uh, use their discovery algorithm and and to put. Oh, uh, you just never see. You R never Kelly. see Got exactly. It. Yeah. It, I wonder, could you generate a compelling enough radio? Like a, a algorithmically generated playlist by just telling them the artists that you don't like. Well, they, the artists they you could do probably like. do. It. I mean, that's one of the things. Looking at Title and Spotify, Spotify's like Title finally added like we made a list for you, and it's certainly what was always amazed me about Spotify is how good it was at, at introducing me to artists that I'd never heard of, mm -hmm. uh, but would enjoy. Versus Title, which is like this is a mishmash of stuff you basically already listened to, and we're just smart enough to know that you listened to this already, and we threw it in here. Um, You're a, you care about audio quality, so isn't that's a huge factor in the title subscription? I imagine. No, I, I got the title subscription because it's such a big deal to so many people. When I when I'm dealing with 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 audio companies, like uh, you know, a lot of them, oh, Spotify, it's it's only you know, it's just like back off, dude. Like blind A/B test me and tell me the difference between the 300 megabit per second uh, megabit, um, the 300 kilobit per second Spotify versus the title lossless. And I think in many cases, unless it's in a perfect testing environment, they're not going to tell the difference. But you could. Uh, I don't even think I can on a on a unless really? I don't know. I, I it's part of it. The stuff's so hard to AB, and the way we process audio is really difficult. I'm just saying. Like titles, titles, titles got like two tricks. It's got lossless audio, which appeals to audiophiles, and it has a bunch of exclusive relationships with artists um, because of the ownership. Uh, but so much of the actual, like, like Rude Labs basically exists because Title is such a piece of crap to work with, you know, in terms of the interface on the hmm. phones and stuff. I just, I think Spotify, in terms of experience and finding music, Spotify is so much better than Title. And this is, I mean, it's inter like it never even occurred to me that they, they didn't allow you to block artists. But I think about artists I'd like to block all the time on Tidal because it's, Tidal is in so many ways this weird like, you just opened up Tidal and we're going to tell you about this album you didn't listen to the first 12 times we told you about it. But we still have this advertising contract for this artist. So we're going to tell you about this artist you don't listen to and you never listened to anything in this genre. But this artist, you know what I mean? Versus Spotify, which seems to always manage to find me new and interesting things to listen to. That's my kind of, that's my thought is that isn't, if you have to block an artist, isn't that a failing of their algorithm to begin with, that it's even suggesting you something that you yeah, would go uh, as far as yes, to block? Yes, but I don't think any algorithm is going to be perfect because uh, the algorithms are, because it's so subjective, right? You could, you could not like an artist. Yeah. Like you mentioned R. Kelly. We don't listen to R. Kelly for reasons not yeah. related to his music. And or so maybe I would like to mute him. You were a huge Drake fan and you were at CES and you got tickets for the Drake show and Drake showed up like two and a half hours late, played for 30 minutes. And you were so pissed off. You just don't want to hear Drake for a while. Block. There you go. <laughs> Spotify also is rumored to finally be releasing a physical device, a in-car player, uh, which people think will uh, be $100. Apparently some Spotify users were presented with an ad, a pre-order ad in their apps last year teasing this player. What the hell is this? So it's a dedicated playback device that connects over Bluetooth to your car's and so you can play Spotify as opposed to using your phone. And you pay an increased subscription fee, like a $13 a month subscription fee, to get 4G connectivity and play music. Oh, it's and, it's internet connected. Internet Wasn't this supposed connected. to be Mighty? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, Mighty was one that's supposed to be like, because I'm laughing as this thing. I've never actually seen one in the real world, but Mighty, BeMighty.com, they've been talking about like, it is a, a it is a digital audio player for Spotify. Yeah, I mean, and I, that is exactly what it is. And it goes show that, like, even though you have the one device that does everything. My phone. Your phone. Sometimes it's better to have discrete devices just for the user experience. There are some really good, you know, discrete devices, especially for, for streaming Spotify and Tidal and stuff um, that have come out in the last year from Fio and, and some other companies. And so, it's a stopgap for them not having relationships with car companies to build the service into the car companies, into the cars themselves. 
Well, but it's built into the operating systems of the phones that people connect to their cars. So. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's still Bluetooth. Just get it blessed by CarPlay and app, you know, Android Auto, and then it's practically a native app. Then you got to work through mm-hmm. Apple. Then you got to pay them fees. Do you? I always wondered about that. I would be shocked if you didn't, especially in a yeah. universe with Apple Music. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, speaking of some car news, uh, Tesla. Let's go back to some Tesla news. Tesla increased their supercharger prices. Makes it a little less competitive than oh, no. in some places where gas is cheap in the country. Uh, there was s- enough backlash on this that Tesla then backed down. And while the prices are still higher on not the supercharger, all, yeah, not all the way back down. They, they met somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. And their explanation for Tesla is that uh, from Tesla is that this this price increase is to help expand the supercharger network. But this also comes on news that Tesla has been is planning on laying off some of their employees, a significant portion of the workforce. Um, to maintain profitability and and grow because they're expected to launch a couple new cars in the it, next year or two. Interesting that there's so much more Tesla news on our podcast in the past few months, Norm. Mm, especially since you know, last April. That's interesting. Yeah, but it's been popping up in my Google feeds. That's weird. <laughs> uh, last bit of Tesla news, I promise. Uh, <laughs> Elon tweeted that uh, 360 or Century Mode will soon be unveiled. What's that? It's uh, what people are hoping... There's no details, no confirmation yet. It's a 360 camera mode so that while you're parked, you can leave the camera on and record everything happening around your car huh. for people who may be damaging your car. Ooh. A century record dash cam, but using all the cameras around the car. Sounds Makes like sense. James Bond. I mean, there's going to be advanced summon mode that's coming out soon, and that will be right out of the James Bond film. And then the defensive mode. Where you, where you drive the car with your phone. You can turn and not just go forward and backward. You mean like in a garage? Right now, yeah. Well, right now you can <laughs> go forward and backward with summon mode. Yeah. But now with the advanced summon mode, theoretically you can actually hmm. turn. If Han- it, if somebody uh, attacks your car and it's using sentry mode, yes, will it alert you? I don't think so. It should. It should give you a feed, give you a power to talk to the criminals. That's that's way too advanced. I okay. think it's going to be just video recording. And, you know, your, your mileage may vary depending on where you live, whether you can actually get the cops to do anything about it. Yeah. Honda um, is going to be uh, showing off its new EV at the Geneva Motor Show in March. Uh, this is their urban EV, and it doesn't look like the Civic. It kind of looks a little bulbous, a little... It's not going to look like this. That's the, what, that's the official Honda sketch. Uh-huh. It, it kind of looks like a, a Wally era robot. The eyes are perfectly circular. It looks like a bumper car, actually. Yeah. I don't. EVs don't need to look so different, right? You don't, you don't think so? No. There's no reason to stand out and say, "Look at me, I'm an EV." Splend them with the cars. I kind of feel like they should. People are afraid. Of, I'm afraid of change. How do you How do you feel about EVs, Patrick Norton? You, you're kind of a ICE man. <laughs> right, <laughs> I, I love my diesel truck. It's you know what? As soon as I can figure out a way to, oh man! Um, but you're also a technophile. How do you? How do those two clash? Sometimes you just want delete expletive to run, which is why a lot of people I know still run Windows Seven because they don't have to deal with Windows Ten creating complications in their life. Uh, no, it, it's I I. I, I I apologize. I can't think of the man's name, but he lives in the East Bay, and he's the guy who figured out he reverse engineered essentially the systems to allow you to do things like reset um, the controls the for uh, uh, Teslas after they've been through an accident, right? Because Tesla basically, mm. as soon as a car has an accident, they basically want to disappear in a black hole. They don't want to sell parts. They don't want it. They they want you to basically like make the car disappear and produce a new one um, because they have some long term issues. There's whatever Tesla's complicated. But he has been, he teaches people how to, he, he reverse engineered the, the connection into, to be able to remote connect into the, the car and upgrade the firmware and reset yeah. the sensors and rebuild them. And, you know, he's got this crazy, I want to say it's the motor from a X and I think he, he plans on repurposing it into a motor for a sprinter, which means it has a lot of torque. I would love a flat torque curve, which you get from an electric engine. I would love, you know, any of a number of the electric motors that are available, but currently, it would be difficult for the charging environment I have and the type of travel I do. Uh, as soon as I get to the point where yeah. where I can like swap a battery pack out of my truck, 
you know, at the local whatever it's called. You know what I mean? Like, or I can supercharge a truck. It'll be really, really tempting. But for a lot of stuff I do, like I can easily get 100 miles from, you know, a town or a highway. So, you know, to have yeah. a, the, the range I need is really difficult to replace electricity currently. So it's, it's of, not about a deep seated love of the smell of gasoline. I mean, I love the smell of gasoline, but I also, I love the flat torque curve is a lot more, you know, obscene and delightful to me than the smell of 116 octane racing fuel. Right, good. Um, but you know, it's also the expense of an electric vehicle right now yeah. is prohibitive and kind of brutal. But especially, it's, early, it's early days. Yeah. But it's, you know, I have friends that are like, you know, they're killing the electric car. It's like, no, dude. Like, if, if the average family of four in the United States lives on like 40 or 50 grand a year, paying an extra $13,000 for an electric car is a brutal and difficult thing. You know what I mean? So, like, I would love, you know, as soon as the, the Gigafactory scales up and everybody has cheap batteries, you know, I'll be happy to, to figure out how to put the electric engine in my car. I also want to see Tesla's, you know, what they look like when they're seven or eight years old at this point. Because um, <laughs> they, they seem to be either amazing or nightmarish. And I know, like, two or three people personally who have had to have wheel motors swapped on Tesla Model S's. And that just seems really expensive to amortize into the cost of a vehicle they're producing. You know, the Model 3 seemed to be better, except one friend of mine with the Model 3, I think 20% of his ownership time, it's been in the shop for repairs. So, you know, I'm curious and excited, and I want, I want to see Tesla succeed in the worst possible way, but uh, I don't have the money to help them do that right now. <laughs> awesome. All right, I Sorry. think we are out of time. Out of time. On the podcast, unfortunately. Uh, so we're going to not do a full VR Minute. Uh, I will give a recommendation. Variety has a story about um, what happened with Meta, the AR company that we checked out uh, over two years ago now, um, and they had a uh, they, they're basically bankrupt and no, I mean it's it's sold. It's a failed company, unfortunately. Um, and so the AR is very hard. And even though you know they had a big TED talk and a you know, second generation <laughs> product, um, it's it's not easy to figure this out. We're still very, very early days and there'll be a lot of failure before yeah. we have successes. Fail early, fail often. Yep. Um, I think that's it. Uh, Patrick. Sir. Where can people find you and what's been going on with Tech Thing? Oh man, uh, we did two weeks of CES coverage and we've got a review of a product I can't talk about coming out next week. Um, but uh, What kind of product? A computer. Okay. <laughs> and actually, Shannon had some fun. She got Linux running on a Huawei MatePook X this week and talks a bunch about how much better uh, laptop support is for Linux these days and actually some of the performance issues. So you may not have to buy a specific Linux-branded notebook anymore. Hmm. Uh, we got pretty geeky on that one. Very cool. And people can find you on Twitter at Patrick Norton. Yes, please. All righty. Uh, Jeremy. Yes. Do you want an outro? I do want an outro. <laughs> what is uh, what is your Twitter handle? No, uh, Chan. At N Chan. You are at Jareware. Slower. slower. <laughs> uh, and we got some fun videos on the site. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, we're starting to release our series that Adam did with uh, Terry English, in Woo! which he um, spent uh, two weeks um, learning to build um, Arthurian armor out of Whoa. aluminum, just like the film uh, Excalibur. Uh, so that's on our YouTube channel as well. We also have some test videos. Sean reviewed uh, Dremel's new 3D printer. Mm -hmm. um, and we have some how-tos about making SLA curing stations coming out soon. You have a headphone and review. And I up, reviewed, uh, today. yes, the Sony headphone review, uh, the 1000 XM3s, which I, I love very much. Although, uh, as I say in the review, I, I don't solely use those because I also... If I am not traveling, I have my Hi-Fi Mans that I really like. These are noise-canceling headphones. Active noise-canceling headphones. Patrick, are you down with active noise-canceling? I have a pair of Sennheisers in my bag. Uh, the 900s are from Sony are amazing, and sometimes they show up for well under $200 at Costco uh, if you want to get an amazing bargain and a very, very well-performing headphone. That was the surprising thing for me, that active noise-canceling had gotten to a point where you're not sacrificing audio quality and you're not getting like a low hum. I think Bose has kind of had has everybody thinking that that using active noise canceling, and there's active, in terms of like killing noise, it's amazing, but their musical quality is kind of crappy. Um, and I like the sound of the Sonys. Yeah, they're really good. Yeah. Expensive though, I found mine on eBay, um, and they, they do go on sale uh, occasionally. All right, uh, that does it. And we do have an outro, Jeremy. From Mad Cat. It's outro three, TikTok. Hi there, I didn't see you. That's it.
Don't you start with tick? I want to say talk, tick, talk, tick, tick, talk, talk, tick, tick, talk, tick, talk, talk. Oh my god. That was pretty awesome. I think this episode will be ripe for outro material. If you want to make an outro, you can just search Tested Podcast Outro. Head to the site and you can download the template, upload it to SoundCloud, post in the co- uh, forums, or just email it to me, norman at test.com, and we'll play one in the future. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. And we're out. Tro. Mm-hmm.